Um, y'all know me. I'm. I love music. I love music. It's clear. Uh, and I'm a hip hop fan. I never really got into R and B too much, but I respect the genre of R and B. I do. Um, but there's a sister by the name of Beyonce. Beyonce is a very interesting figure. And um, I, I heard the judgment in that. <laughs> Beyonce is a very interesting figure. And I did not come here to cast stones at her or to judge her. In fact, um, one might argue that I'd like to sing her praises today. Because through all the controversy, through all the scandal, through all the drama, through through all the things that celebrities go through, uh, go through I, I've noticed something very consistent with Beyonce. Beyonce does not just produce songs. Beyonce produces anthems. All throughout her career, she, she's never just produced songs. She produces anthems. But what am I saying? Her first single, Crazy in Love, I think I was in high school when that came out, became a love anthem for everybody. Okay, some of you remember Irreplaceable, you know, to the left, to the left. That, that, that became an official breakup anthem. Oh, okay, okay. Um, let's, let's, let's not forget uh, Who Runs the World, Girls, became a, women, a woman's liberation anthem. It seems like everything this woman puts out becomes an anthem. Well, she recently released a new album. And she has given us another anthem. <laughs> uh, it's funny, I was reading an article on it and they were saying that Beyonce helped to usher in uh, a, a resignation wave that people began quitting their jobs after this song came out. The song is called Break My Soul. And she starts off, I just fell in love. I just quit my job. In other words, Beyonce was sick of it. There, there, there was a lot going on, too much for her. She got fed up, and she made a declaration that even though there are things breaking around me, one thing that will not break and I will not allow you to break is my soul. And this is why I don't see how y'all were able to contain yourselves as I read this scripture. Because Paul has never heard of Beyonce. But Paul was testifying the same thing that she's testifying on this new album. That um, we're afflicted in every way, but you won't break my soul. Uh, we're perplexed, but you won't break my soul. We're persecuted, but you won't break my soul. We are struck down, but you won't break my soul. Uh, the Apostle Paul, I believe, was channeling the spirit of Beyonce in this text before he even knew Beyonce was a Beyonce. And, and I believe he's given me a text for today that I'd like to grapple with. And if I were to give today's sermon a title, it would simply be, You Won't Break My Soul. Oh, exactly. Now, normally I would say turn to your neighbor and, and share with them today's sermon. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to say do something different this morning. I want you to tell the devil, devil. Devil, you won't break my soul. You won't break my soul. Some of y'all were still tempted to look at your neighbor because you think your neighbor the devil, but you keep looking straight and say it one more time, devil. You won't break my soul. You won't break my soul. I want to share with you today uh, three reasons nothing. Somebody say nothing. nothing. Three reasons nothing can break your soul. Three reasons nothing can break your soul. The Apostle Paul is writing a second letter to the church of Corinth, which if I remember my research correctly, uh, some believe this is actually the fourth letter of Paul, that there were letters in between 1st and 2nd Corinthians that we don't have. And in fact, Paul makes reference um, to these letters in between in one of his uh, letters that we do have. And so Paul is writing this letter to the church of Corinth. I like to call them his ratchet church because they always had something going on. And in this particular letter, Paul is somewhat trying to make amends with them. I, I heard Pastor Howard John Wesley do a very phenomenal teaching on this. Uh, Paul sent them a heated letter where he was really getting at them. He, he was really letting them know how he really felt about some things. Some things had transpired during his previous visit to the church of Corinth and Paul wasn't feeling it. He let them know, I really was not feeling this. Um, but Paul also had a giving campaign going. Paul was trying to raise money for the church at Jerusalem and he realized that uh, his clapbacks at the Corinthians might affect his offering. 
And so he's writing this letter to somewhat kind of make amends. And his, his tone has definitely changed. But he gets to this particular part of the text because he's addressing everything that's going on. And he's also trying to make a case for his uh, position as an apostle. And so he's trying to remind them that, listen, I am who I say I am. And I have the authority to do what I do because I have been through some things. Will you help your neighbor real quick? Say, neighbor. Yeah. Uh, uh, what gives you your authority today is the stuff you went through yesterday. I know there are folks who think you are unqualified to do what you do. Um, but you don't have to break out your degree. Uh, you don't have to break out your Greek and Hebrew. All you got to do is let them know when I look back over my life and I see where the Lord has brought me from. I, I'm, I'm well qualified to say what I'm saying. I'm well qualified to do what I'm doing. I'm well qualified to walk where I'm walking. Paul says, y'all need to check my resume. Let me tell y'all something. I, 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 I've been uh, persecuted. I've been cast down. I've been crushed. I've been perplexed. But in spite of everything that I've been through, uh, that thing could not break my soul. There are a lot of things that broke around me. In fact, I was whipped and it broke my skin. I, I was beat and I broke some bones. But one thing they could not break was my soul. And so Paul begins to share with them uh, 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 his testimony. He begins to share with them all that he's been through, but he's trying to make an actual point. And he's trying to get them to realize that the reason he has not broken is because he's in possession of something. And I want to share with you those three things that we're in possession of as well that keeps our soul from being broken. Can I share those this morning? Amen. The first reason nothing can break your soul is because there's something precious inside of you. There's something precious inside of you. I'm going to give you three P's on this morning. Somebody say, there's something precious inside of me. Say it like you mean it. There's something precious inside of me. Y'all sound like y'all got low self-esteem, but it's cool. Uh, verse 7 says, verse 7 says, now we have this treasure in clay jars. The King James says it like this. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. This is a favorite scripture of the bishop. He quotes it often. Uh, uh, but what is Paul actually saying here? I, I've heard this text exegete many different ways. Uh, but what is this treasure that he's talking about? What are these clay jars that he's talking about? Well, as I began to research a little further, I discovered that Paul is using symbolism here. That, that the treasure symbolizes something and the clay jars or the earthen vessels actually symbolize something. Can I teach you a little bit this morning? Uh, uh, the clay jars symbolize something. The treasure symbolizes something. So the question you should be asking yourself is, what is Paul trying to symbolize here? Well, uh, let's deal with the clay jars. These earthen vessels, these clay jars that the Apostle Paul is talking about. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, neighbor. that's you. Uh, you, you are the clay jar that the Apostle Paul is talking about. He says there's a treasure in this clay jar. Now, uh, why would Paul equate us to clay jars? Well, if you know anything about clay, clay is made from dirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clay is just modified dirt. It's dirt that's been wet and then molded and shaped into something and then put through some fire uh, uh, to finalize what it was supposed to become. And so the Apostle Paul says that there is treasure in these clay jars. Somebody's light bulb will go off in a moment. There, there, there's something valuable that God put in something dirty. <laughs> God took something of high value and put it into something messy. Why would God take something valuable? And we don't even know what the treasure is yet. Why would God take something valuable and put it in something invaluable? Well, uh, God is trying to make a point that nothing you do, you can take credit for. Because what makes you valuable is not what you do. <laughs> What makes you valuable is that I made you and I put something in you, watch this, that you could not put in yourself. And so the Apostle Paul says that uh, your soul can't be broken because there's something valuable inside of you. Watch this. Even though you have no value, God looked at you and said, I'm going to put some value in you. Even though you're made of the lowest thing. You, you remember the creation account. The Bible says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's interesting. He says, I'm going to make man in my image after my likeness. I'm the highest being. I'm God. I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm going to make something in my image after my likeness. But he did not grab the gold. He did not grab the silver. He did not grab 
have the platinum. The Bible says he stooped and scooped, he formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into man uh, 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 the breath of life and man became a living soul. I'm so glad that when God does a thing, he takes the worst of the worst to make the best of the best. He takes the least of the least to make the most of the most. I don't get up here and brag because I'm all that in a bag of Doritos. I, I get up here and brag because God put something valuable and somebody invaluable. Someone who really had nothing to offer God, but God said, I got everything to offer you. And so he says, you have this treasure. You have this valuable thing. Uh, but I put it in a clay jar. <laughs> I put it in a mess. I, I, I saw a mess and I said I want to put something valuable in it. Now what's interesting is I did my homework a little bit because I'm like where in the world is Paul getting this from? Because uh, as I began to research, people don't put valuable things in clay jars. Ah, in fact, one commentator suggested that the clay jars uh, many times would even be used for things as lowly as human waste. Ah. And so God took something that's normally used for human waste and said, I'm going to put something valuable to it. Yeah, I'm going to take something that stinks. I'm going to take something that no one saw value in. I'm going to take something that no one appreciated come through somebody. I'm going to take something that no one saw value in, but I'm going to put something very valuable in it. So we're the clay jars, we're the earthen vessels, but now we got to deal with this treasure. Because what sort of treasure do you put in a clay jar? I'm thinking, of course, diamonds, emeralds, rubies, but, but no, the Apostle Paul isn't talking about that. And if you read a couple of verses above this particular verse, what you'll notice is that the treasure that Paul is talking about is the gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've heard this preached a lot of ways. But, but the truth of the matter is, if, if you just know how to read, you ain't got to have no Greek and Hebrew. If you just know how to read, you can see that the Apostle Paul is talking about the gospel. That the treasure that he puts in the earthen vessel, in the clay jar, is, is the gospel. Now, some of y'all ain't getting excited because you don't know where we get the word gospel from. Uh, uh, see, that word gospel uh, is actually a form of good news. So when you hear the gospel, what we're really saying is the good news. And so... Paul is communicating to us that God put good news in a bad vessel. <laughs> God put good news in a bad thing. You better work now. God put good news in a dirty thing. God put good news in a messy thing. Yes, sir. Okay. Good news is words. Uh -huh. And so the treasure that God put in these vessels is words. There, there's a word that God put in the vessel. And that word, they're not getting it, Bishop. That word is good news. Good news, watch this, is a message. And so God put a message in a mess. He says, your soul can't be broken. Because God put a good message yeah. in a big mess. <laughs> let me see. If, let, let, let me see, let me see if I can make this plain. Y'all, y'all ain't getting it yet. Um, y'all know. I like how stuff works. And so I'm on YouTube all the time trying to find out how stuff works. And one thing that I can never figure out is how they get that piece of paper in a fortune cookie. So I went to YouTube. And I discovered that there's a factory that makes fortune cookies. Now, believe it or not, fortune cookies, the first fortune cookie was not made in China. It was actually made in California. The more you know. There's a factory that makes fortune cookies. It's really an American thing. And, and, and I discovered that the way fortune cookies are made now, the big question for me was, is, is the paper cooked in it? Do they slide it in after? How do they get this piece of paper in this cookie? It boggled my mind. And so I'm watching this factory, and I'm watching how they process it. They, 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 they make the dough for the cookie, and uh, uh, I believe they said it's about 20% sugar. So when you're eating a fortune cookie, it's like 20% sugar. Yeah, diabetes through the roof. And so uh, they pour in all this sugar, and they, they make this dough mix, and they mix it all up. And after they mix it all up, 
uh, it, it gets squirted through into this pancake shape, and each one is the same size. And I'm still watching, but I'm not seeing no piece of paper yet. And so uh, it, it gives the shape to it, and it goes on this conveyor belt, and then it's cooked. But they cook it only to a point where it's still flexible. Wow. So it's been through the fire, wow. but it has not been hardened. Yes. I give God praise because I've been through some fires. And no matter how high the fire got, I never got hardened. A whole lot of folks ain't make it out the fire unhardened. But I give God praise today because I came through the fire. And it didn't make me hard. In fact, watch this. It made me moldable. Yeah. I'm so glad that I came through the fire. And God said, I'm going to make you into something. Yeah. Ah, nevertheless, it goes through the fire. But it's not hardened. And then what happens is it continues on the conveyor belt. And watch this. A word is pressed upon the cookie. Yeah. yeah. While the, while the cookie is still bendable, watch this, a word comes from above, and the word is impressed into it, and the word is pressed till it makes the shape of the cookie. Ha. The Bible says, the world was framed by the word. I was framed by the word. I know y'all ain't see Pastor Mike when I was 15. But I was being framed by the word. What blessed me about that, what, what, what blessed me about that is what it told me was that the word came in the process. That before the cookie got out of the process, it got a word. I'm going to tell you what else messed me up. That even in that point of the process, y'all pray for Bishop, in the point of the process, watch this, every cookie got a different word. This cookie didn't get the same word as this cookie. And that cookie didn't get the same word as this cookie. And this is why, I don't know why y'all be all in your neighbor business when they're going through their process. Because they word ain't your word. Oh, oh. So let me get my word in my process. Oh my because you went through your process and got your word. Oh my God. So a word comes from above. And it's pressed into the cookie. And as the word presses the cookie, it gets folded into the shape that we then receive. Yeah. That blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. That, that blows my mind. So now I know the mystery of the fortune cookie. But, but, but that's not it though. That's not it though, because now there's this cookie that has this word in it. But there's only one way to get the word. The only way to get the word is you gotta break the cookie. And what I love about it, what what I love about it is. When you break the cookie, yes. you don't break the word. Yes. Oh. Oh. I know when they let you go at the job, it broke you. But it didn't break your word. I know when they walked out your life, it broke your heart. But it didn't break your word. I know when church folks start tripping on you, it, it broke your spirit a little bit. But it didn't break your word. I'm so glad. Jesus. That I serve a God who says, listen, I will let you break, but in the breaking, there's going to be a word. If you want to know the word of God for your life, you got to be willing to be broken. And watch this. You have to trust that no matter what is broken in your life. It can't break your soul. It might break your bank account, but it won't break your soul. It might break up your relationship, but 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 it won't break your soul. It, it, it might break up where you clock in tomorrow, but it, it won't break your soul. It, it, it might break up your church membership, but 
but it won't break your soul. Somebody shout, it won't break my soul. It won't break my soul. I love how God does a thing. He says, I put this treasure in this clay jar. Okay, let me go Bible. Uh, uh, um, the Bible says that there's a woman caught in the very act of adultery. Now, I don't know how you do that unless you're a peeping Tom, but she's caught in the very act. They don't talk about that in the Bible, but she's caught in the very act, quote unquote. And so they bring this woman to Jesus and they say, Jesus, it is written, you know, if, if a woman is caught this way, that she's to be stoned. And Jesus begins doing something strange. The Bible says that Jesus uh, takes a page out of his daddy's book. He stoops and stoops. <laughs> he starts writing in the dirt. And people try to figure out what Jesus wrote. I don't know what Jesus wrote. Can I be honest on this morning? I don't care what Jesus wrote. I don't. What I care about is that he wrote. Yeah. And he wrote. In dirt. She was caught in her dirt. And her dirt was brought to Jesus. Jesus received her dirt. But watch this. He did not respond to her dirt. The way they responded to her dirt. Watch this. Jesus knew what the Bible said about her dirt. But don't forget. Jesus is the word. I, I, I love what Jesus does. He says, well, he says, I know, I know what's written about her dirt, but I am the word. I'm the author and finisher of her faith. So I'm not going to make an edit. I'm going to make an addition. Because my word can't return to me void. This is what I wrote. But I'm going to make an addition to it. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that Jesus writes in dirt. I'm so glad that the only reason I'm standing here today is because somebody brought my dirt to Jesus and Jesus wrote in my dirt. That when folks wanted to throw my dirt, Jesus said, I'm going to modify the dirt. Paul is trying to get us to realize that there's something precious inside of us. And the thing that's precious inside of us is a message. It's the good news. And watch this. Sometimes the only way to get that message out is through your mess. This is why we have to get to a place where we, 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 we stop covering up stuff. Because somebody may need the mess, I mean the message, that's inside of your mess. Because whether we want to agree with it or not, many of us have been through the same mess. And sometimes I just need to know that there is something after the mess I'm in. And this is why the Bible says we are overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Listen, I ain't saying you got to be graphic in everything you say, but 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 we are living epistles, read of all men. Sometimes folks just need to read the message that came out of your mess. He says, listen, there's something valuable inside of you. And the reason the enemy cannot break your soul is because God saw dirt. And in that dirt, he said, I want to put the most valuable thing I have. And that's the gospel. Some of you say, Pastor Mike, I don't know how to evangelize. The best way you can evangelize is survive what you're going through. Because your survival story will become all the evangelism that you need. Folks will look at you and say, there's no way you came through that. But you can say, the devil is a lie. I did. I survived. And it's only by the grace of God. Three reasons nothing can break your soul. The first reason, because there's something precious inside of you. The second reason nothing can break your soul is because there is a power at work inside of you. There's a power at work inside of you. Y'all sleepy this morning. There's a power at work inside of you. It's okay. Starbucks on me after church. Verse 7 says, uh, so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. So the Apostle Paul says, because there is a work inside of me, there's a, a, a power inside of me, 
uh, everything that happens after that does not matter. Because there's a power at work inside of me. And so the reason I can be afflicted in every way, not some ways, but every way, and not be crushed is because there's a power at work inside of me. The reason I'm perplexed but I'm not in despair is because there's a power at work inside of me. The reason I'm persecuted but not abandoned is because there's a power at work inside of me. The reason the enemy can strike me down but I not be destroyed is because there's a power at work inside of me. But here's the catch. The power that's at work inside of me ain't my own. Come on. Ah. The Apostle Paul wants us to know, he says, watch this, there is an extraordinary power. (laughs) And this extraordinary power goes beyond you. In fact, this extraordinary power that's working inside of you actually came from God. Now, Paul is using symbolism again. What is this power that the Apostle Paul is talking about? Uh, Well, we like to say it this way, uh, uh, especially on Pentecost Sunday, uh, After the Holy Ghost will come upon you, Mm -hmm. you shall have power. Ah, So the power that Paul is talking about is the Holy Spirit. He says, listen, the only reason I have not fallen apart in my flesh is because there's a power, a spirit at work inside of me. There is a power that I receive from an outside source that's working inside of me that no matter what's happening around me, it cannot crush me because there's something inside of me. There is a power. It comes from that Greek word dunamis, where we get the, uh, the, the English word dynamite. He says there is an explosive power inside of me that no matter what is crumbling around me there's something that explodes inside of me and I find myself with strength I didn't know I had I find myself with endurance I didn't know I had I find myself with patience I didn't know I had I find myself with the peace of God which surpasses all understanding a peace of God that does not make sense a peace of God that does not match my surroundings and it's all the result of an explosive power that's at work inside of me but I can't take credit for that power because that power did not come from me. That power came from God. He says there's an extraordinary power that came from God and it's the only reason you have not been destroyed. See if I can explain. Um, When I used to work at Canon, I used to always get mad. And I'm going to tell you why. Because whenever a storm would come through, and knock out the power, I would get excited for a second because I'm like, we ain't got to work no more. Power just went. But then about 10 seconds later, the power would come back on. Now, it didn't make sense because I could look out the window and I could see that the lights were still off at other buildings. But for some reason, lights were still on in our building. And I would have to keep working. And I couldn't find out why this was happening. So I knew somebody with our IT team, and I decided to ask them one day, how come when storms come and knock the power out and everybody around us gets to stop working, we still working because all of a sudden the power just comes back on. Like You got a super building, what is happening? You got to make this make sense to me. And he says, well, uh, uh, here's what's happening. We have what they call an emergency backup generator that's connected to the building. And what happens is when the lights go off in the building, That generator is constantly watching. And so if it's sunny outside, it's watching. If it's raining outside, it's watching. If it's snowing outside, it's watching. If there's a tornado outside, it's watching. If it's a hurricane outside, it's watching. If it's daylight, it's watching. If it's nighttime, it's watching. The generator is always watching. And the moment that it sees us not responding, it kicks in. Watch up! An explosion takes place. And watch this, it switches off the power of the building to the power from the generator. What you say? Okay, let me see if I can make this plain. Uh, 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 the generator is always watching. Okay, we like to say it this way. We serve a God who does not sleep nor slumber. He's always watching. In good days, he's watching. In bad days, he's watching. When we stressed out, he's watching. When we happy, He's watching. No matter what's going on, he's watching. And the moment we're not responding, the moment a storm comes uh, and we cannot respond properly to the storm, an explosion takes place and power is transferred from this source to this source. Okay. I was watching a video one and they were breaking it all down and the brother said something very important and I want to leave this with you. He said, um, 
The key to using your backup emergency generator efficiently and successfully is to make sure it's installed before the storm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say so, say so. Yeah. Say it again. Work on it. He says the key yeah. to making the most use of your emergency backup generator yeah. is you have to have it installed before the storm. Okay, the season saint said it this way. There's a storm out yes, on the ocean. Yes, sir. And it's moving this old way. If your soul's not yes, anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. Ah, Paul says if you got the Holy Ghost, yes, no matter what storms may come your way, you don't have to worry about being washed out with the storm. Yes, you don't have to worry about being blown away yes, by the storm. Yes, you don't have to worry about being knocked down yes, in the storm. Why? Because you made a connection before the storm. And when your power ran out, the Holy Ghost power kicked in. It's funny, I think back to times when Bishop would be up here preaching and he would rev real quick and say, I had to kick in my Holy Ghost generator. I wish you would look at somebody on today and say, neighbor, you need to work your Holy Ghost generator. The reason some of y'all are fainting in your storm is because you're depending on your own power. But the Apostle Paul is saying, baby, there's a power that surpasses your power. There is a power on the inside of you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There's a power on the inside of me that can take on what's happening around me. And when I don't have power, the Apostle Paul said it this way, there was a thorn that afflicted me and I prayed and said, God, take it from me. But he said, my my grace is sufficient. Yeah. And Paul said, but why? He said, because in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. When you don't have the strength, I'll be your strength. When you don't have the words, I'll be your words. When you don't have the way, I'll be your way. I, I will be the strength when you have none. Paul says, uh, the reason you can't break my soul <laughs> is because there is a power at work on the inside of me. But it's not of my own. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad because there were so many days where I did not think I could make it. Yeah. But I had a Holy Ghost generator. Yes, there were times I thought I would lose my mind. Yes. But I had a Holy Ghost yes, generator. Yes. There were times I did not think I would make it to the next day, but yes. I had a Holy Ghost generator. Yes. Some Sundays I didn't think I would make it into this pulpit. Yes. But I had a Holy Ghost generator. Yes. There were times I started preaching, ran out of words, but the Holy Ghost kept going. Yes. Because there's a power at work inside of me that's greater than what's going on around me. Yes. The reason you can't, the enemy can't break your soul is because there is a power at work inside of you. But not only that, there is uh, something precious inside of you. There is a power at work inside of you, but also uh, there is a person you carry inside of you. There is a person you carry inside of you. I'm, I'm not saying everybody's pregnant, but there's a person that you carry inside of you. What am I saying? The Apostle Paul continues to go in verses 10 through 14. He says, we always carry the death of Jesus in our body. So that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. So then, death is at work in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, in keeping with uh, what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us, I love that part, with Jesus and present us with you. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. I got to read it one more time. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Uh, the Apostle Paul is communicating to them that, listen, in spite of whatever is happening, in spite of whatever is going down, in spite of whatever you're going through, uh, uh, you are carrying the death of Jesus inside of you. If you are a believer, you believe that he died on Calvary's cross and was resurrected early one Sunday morning, I feel Baptist, uh, 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 that you carry the death of Jesus in you. However, the only reason you're carrying the death of Jesus in you is because through carrying the death of Jesus in you, you carry the life of Jesus in you. And so he's painting a picture for them. He says, listen, I know you see me going through 
But in my going through, it sheds light on the life of Jesus Christ. And this is why you got to be careful how you're going through. Some of you are going through wrong. I know you didn't think there's a wrong way to go through. But yes, when you're a believer, there's a right way to go through. Yes. And it's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the text. He says, listen, I, I, I know that I'm afflicted in every way, but I won't be crushed. I know I'm perplexed, but I will not be in despair. I know I'm persecuted, but I will not feel abandoned. I know I'm struck down, but I will not be destroyed. In other words, I refuse to look like what I'm going through. Because no matter what I'm going through, I know who's inside of me. And the person that's inside of me, I have to make sure I represent him well. So even in my suffering, even when they have me on the cross, I can look at the people who put me on the cross and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's a right way to go through. My going through is not going to consist of me talking about you. My going through is not going to consist of me running your name in the mud. My going through is not going to consist of me trying to get back at you. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good. The devil is a lie. Just because you sling mud don't mean I'm going to sling mud. But I'm going to go through the way Jesus went through. And so he said, I carry the death of Jesus in me because I, I'm also carrying the life of Jesus. But then he makes a very valid point. He says, listen, the reason that's important. It's because when you're carrying the death of Jesus inside of you, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that will raise you up with him. Uh, let's see if I can make this plain. Um, one of my favorite movies, really the whole movie series, is The Matrix. I love The Matrix. Don't judge me. I love The Matrix. But I really love the first one. Every so often, I go back and watch the first Matrix. It's amazing. And what I love about that movie is the final scene. So uh, Mr. Anderson has found out he's Neo, he's the one, which is just a play on that word Neo, and, and, and he's fighting the big boss, the agent, Agent Smith, and they're going at it, going at it. And just when you think Neo is about to make it out of the Matrix, uh, one of the Smiths opens the door and shoots him and continues shooting him until he dies. Now, the love of his life, who he doesn't know is the love of his life yet, Trinity is outside the Matrix, and she's watching everything play out. She watches Neo flatline, and she's looking at Neo, and she does something interesting. She walks up to him, uh, and his real name, excuse me, is Thomas Anderson. And she walks up to this body of Thomas Anderson, and she whispers in his ear. She says, um, Neo, I have something to tell you. I couldn't tell you this before because I was afraid. But when I went to the Oracle, she told me that I would know who the one is because I would fall in love with him. And this is the part that blesses me. I get goosebumps thinking about it. She says, so Neo, you can't be dead because I love you. Listen, listen. I get goosebumps. And after she said that, his heart starts beating. He gets up. He kills the agent. And he gets out the matrix to his room. What am I saying? Thomas Anderson had died, but inside of Thomas Anderson was Neo. <laughs> Trinity saw Thomas Anderson had died, and so she got in his ear to talk to Neo because she understood that though Thomas Anderson could die, Neo couldn't die. So she talked to the man inside of Thomas and told Thomas, I need you to get up. Because you can't be dead. Dying is not an option for you. And because Neo got up, Thomas got up. I'm going to say it again. Because Neo got up, Thomas got up. Okay. Because uh, 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 Jesus got up, Mike got up. Because Jesus got up, Sean got up. Because Jesus got up, TJ got up. Because Jesus got up. Dina got up. Because Jesus got up. Doreen got up. Because Jesus got up. Sister Bill got up. Because Jesus got up, we have to get up. The enemy can kill me, but he can't kill the one inside of me. And because he got up, we get up. He says, your soul can't be broken 
Because there's a person inside of you who can't die. I know you thought you was going to die before you fulfilled your purpose, but if Jesus ain't dead, you can't die. I, I know you like, Lord, I'm getting older. Am I ever going to get a boo? You will. If Jesus ain't dead, you still got time to get your boo. Yeah. So y'all saying, God, I don't think I'm ever going to start this business. If Jesus ain't dead, you still got time. He says, you can't break my soul because of the person I carry inside of me. I got one more. I got one more. I got one more. I got, if I got time for one more. Uh, uh, we, 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 our soul can't be broken because there's something precious inside of us. Our soul can't be broken because there's a power at work inside of us. And our soul can't be broken because of the person we carry inside of us. But I got one more possible. Y'all, y'all, y'all entertain me. Uh, uh, the reason our soul can't be broken is because our suffering is not permanent. Yeah. I thought, thought y'all might feel that. Our suffering is not permanent. What am I saying? Verse 15, he says, uh, indeed, everything is for your benefit so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction. I need you to highlight that in your Bible. Our momentary light affliction. It, it almost sounds like an oxymoron. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. I'm trying to help somebody. But what is unseen is eternal. The Apostle Paul is closing this part of the letter out and he says, listen, every, everything that I just told you I've been through, I went through it for the benefit of you. Again, he's trying, he's trying to get their money at this point. So I know y'all mad at me, but let me tell y'all, I've been through some things and, and me going through those things is actually beneficial for you. You didn't have to go through it. I went through it, and because I went through it, it was for your benefit. Um, and so now the grace, the same grace that brought me through, is the same grace that's poured out on you. And so the gospel is being spread, and souls are being won to the kingdom. Uh, and so he says, listen, no matter what happens, don't give up. Look at somebody say, don't give up. Don't give up. I know it seems like everything around you is dying. I know it seems like your health is decaying. I know it seems like your money's funny and your change is strange. I know they're handing out pink slips at the office. I know it seems like all your friends have become frenemies. I know it seems like you can't even worship good at church because everybody knows your business. But, but, but listen, in spite of what's going on, don't give up. No matter what's happening around you, no matter what's being destroyed, no matter what's falling apart in your life, your inner man is being strengthened. Yes. Every day. Mm -hmm. Watch this. Your outer may be decaying, but your inner is growing younger yeah. and stronger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's why people call the kingdom of God the upside down kingdom. Because it's the opposite of what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So it may look like my finances are going down, but my spirit is being built up. It may yeah. seem like my relationships are decaying, but my spirit is being built up. Mm -hmm. there, there's this, this, this exchange that takes place. Um, and so he says, you're being renewed day by day. But, but here's the part we want to focus on. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This blesses me because he says, this temporary thing mm -hmm. is producing something permanent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The temporary struggle is producing a permanent strength. <laughs> okay. This, 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 this temporary test is producing a permanent testimony. I, I know it seems like you're never going to come out of this, but watch this. Your suffering has an expiration date. Your, 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 your suffering has to come to an end. See, the Bible says it this way. Uh, there's no temptation except that which is common unto man. But with every temptation, watch this, God has made a way of escape. Oh, okay, so before you got in it, God already established a way out. You're just going through it. 
But I can't have you focus so much on what you're going through that you miss out on what you're going to. It only seems like it's taking forever because you're looking at what you're in instead of what you're going to. Right. Stop looking at the issue and start looking at the end. For I know the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Your suffering has an expiration date. In fact, I said it before you went in. Okay. So... We don't focus on what's seen, but what's unseen, because what's seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The reason we feel like our soul is going to break is because we pay attention to the wrong things. That's true. Yeah. Stop focusing so much on what you're in. Yeah. And start focusing on who you're in. I'm going to say that again. Stop focusing so much on what you're in. And focus on who you're in. Stop focusing so much on what you're in. And start focusing on who you're in. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Huh. So watch this. What I'm going through is old news. And I'm on my way to a new place. Okay, let me see if I can. If I can. I'm going to close it out and make it funny. Um, I discovered something. I love ro uh, riding roller coasters. I do. How many of y'all like riding roller coasters? You enjoy the thrill of a roller coaster. I, I did some homework. I did some homework. And I discovered that the average roller coaster ride only lasts 112 seconds. The average roller coaster ride only lasts 112 seconds. Don't miss that. That's that's a little less. Matter of fact, that's eight seconds shy of two minutes. The average roller coaster ride is less than two minutes. Now you stood in line for it for two hours, but the ride is only about two minutes. Okay. With all the upside down, it's only two minutes. With all the sways left and right, it's only two minutes. Okay. With with with, with all the shaking and rumbling. It's only two minutes. Come on, please, man. Ah, okay. With, with all the discomfort, it's only two, two minutes. minutes. Ah, okay. With all the heat that's going on around you, it's only two minutes. Okay. Depending on which ride you're on, no matter how dark it is in there, it's only two minutes. No matter what happens on that ride, it's only two minutes. But here's the dilemma. While you're going through it, it feels like forever. Yes, yes, yes. But if you shift your attention to the end of the ride, you'll realize it's only two minutes. And watch this, watch this. After the two minutes, you have an experience you'll never forget. What's temporary produces What's burning? I know it feels like you've been suffering forever. But if you look at the suffering compared to what God has for you on the other side, you would look at it and say, it was only two minutes. It was good, but I was okay. I know how it feels. But watch this. Your feelings are not facts. Come on, yeah. And the problem is we try to turn our feelings Come on. into facts. And the fact of the matter is, it was only two minutes. Don't matter what it feels like. The fact is, it's only two minutes. Okay. I, I, I know you felt like you couldn't do no better than them. But the fact is, they want nothing. I know you feel like you can't get a better job than that one, but the fact is, you are overqualified for that. Yes. I, I, I know you felt like uh, you couldn't do no better than the last church you was at, but the fact is, he sent you to AL3C, and now you're doing better. Feelings are not facts. And so we have to reprogram our minds to a place where we understand it doesn't matter what it feels like. Yes. The fact is, I've been young 
And I am old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. I, I, I know what it feels like. But many are the afflictions of the righteous. But God delivers us out of them all. I know what it feels like. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It doesn't matter what it feels like. The fact is, God is still in control. I know it feels like you've been on this roller coaster forever. Emotional roller coaster, financial roller coaster, mental roller coaster, spiritual roller coaster. It's been two minutes. And this present suffering does not compare to the glory that's to come. Through that temporary pain, you now walk in a power permanently that you never knew you had. Th th through that temporary suffering, you now have a strength you did not know you possessed. Oh, Through that temporary issue, you now have a permanent outlook on life that you never had before. And so not only is the suffering permanent, the suffering is producing. <laughs> the enemy can't break my soul. And watch this. If the devil was smart, he would stop trying to. You better pray because uh, the testimony of the children of Israel went like this. The more Pharaoh on, afflicted yeah. them, the greater they became. And I don't know what's in your DNA. I don't know if you've been on Ancestry.com. You might have a little Israeli in you. But even if you don't, Jesus said we're grafted in. And so my testimony too is the more I'm afflicted, yes. the greater I become. Can I go old school? I'm a baby's kid. I don't die. I multiply. So you can't break my soul. It was good that I was afflicted. Because God pulled out of me things I never knew. Meet your neighbor real quick. Say neighbor. They can't break your soul. If they didn't get excited, look at somebody else. Say other neighbor. They can't break your soul. Let, let me let me call the repentance line. Uh, the enemy can't break your soul. No matter what's breaking around you. Your money may be breaking, job may be breaking, relationship may be breaking, family may be breaking. Doesn't matter what's breaking around you. The one thing the enemy cannot break is your soul. And Jesus said something interesting. He said, He said, Don't fear the person who can torture the body, but can't do nothing with your soul. Some of you are scared of somebody. Who can't afflict what really matters. He can afflict your money. He can afflict your time. He can afflict everything around you. But, but he, can't, he can't afflict what matters. Because your soul belongs to God. 